Catherine Whitehead is a former program participant at Mission Mountain School where she spent 18 months as a teenager. She currently works for the Mental Health Association of New York City's Coordinated Children's Services Initiative, working toward keeping struggling youth in their communities. Ms. Whitehead is also a co-founder of the Community Alliance for the Ethical Treatment of Youth, an advocacy organization whose mission is ending human rights abuses of youth in residential programs. Good morning, Chairman Miller, Ranking Member McKeon, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. I appreciate your leadership and efforts to help protect youth from abuse and neglect by convening this hearing. I'm here to share the tragic experience of myself and family, an, an unregulated facility in Montana called Mission Mountain School, a NATSAP member program where the headmaster, John Mercer, served on the board of directors for several years. I will also speak on behalf of a youth survivor advocacy group, the Community Alliance for the Ethical Treatment of Youth, to the general concerns of youth placed in private residential care. At the age of 13, I was diagnosed with chronic depression following a suicide attempt and hospitalized at a local psychiatric hospital. When I was discharged, lacking any community-based support, my family sought to identify services outside of my community and found Mission Mountain School at the recommendation of a hired educational consultant. Mission Mountain School held great promise as it was sold to us as a small family-like therapeutic environment for girls ages 12 to 18 with above average intelligence. I packed my treasured belongings, reminders of home, and my mom and I flew out to Montana. I felt hopeful that maybe this special school for kids like me would help as they claim to have the ability to treat any myriad of serious psychiatric issues such as bipolar disorder, eating disorder, and depression. Sadly, this couldn't be further from the truth. Upon arrival, I quickly encountered the punitive and invasive interventions which would come to define my 18 months at Mission Mountain School. My mom left me shortly after we had arrived and most of my belongings were taken from me. I never received any explanation of the rules of the program though the rules quickly took shape during the series of group sessions held daily. Everyone was called out in group when they first arrived. Every infraction was framed as an act of dishonesty. We were all labeled liars and manipulators upon arrival. Often there were punishments when we were thought to have been dishonest, euphemistically called consequences. consequences consequence always involved some type of physical punishment, forced labor, exercise, labor such as ice picking, rock picking, and chopping wood. More serious rule breaking would result in what was called an intervention, which was work crew all day long with breaks only during group, chores, and meal time. There were personal intervention and group interventions. Sometimes the group was placed on interventions which would last weeks, if not months. And during this time, no contact was allowed with the outside world, in, in contrast to our already limited, monitored, and censored contact under usual conditions. It was generally understood that we're being exhausted for the purpose of making us more truthful, whatever that meant to those in charge. Exercise was a daily, rigorous daily requirement. Slowing down from exhaustion only resulted in more exercise or getting yelled at using staff would often use profanity. I was not allowed to speak with my family for months after I arrived and calls thereafter were monitored. Any criticisms were labeled as manipulative and my phone call was promptly disconnected followed by punishment. The most powerful figure at the facility was a headmaster with no formal training in mental health and whose group therapy sessions were particularly bizarre and frightening. He was often confrontational or would smirk and laugh. He would attempt to unearth repressed memories and encourage regressive states. I recall that on multiple occasions, my friends speaking as if they were toddlers, recounting alleged instances of abuse. Hours would be spent with girls reliving their traumatic experiences at the unqualified hands of the staff. Intensive group sessions sometimes lasted all, sometimes lasted all night. Bathroom use was prohibited. Any allegations of abuse discussed in group therapy were never reported by staff to proper authorities. Because of all the founders were members of AA, it seemed to them that everyone was an addict of sorts. I was deemed an alcoholic and a sex addict. A close friend was deemed a sex addict. She had never had sex in her life and denied the claim. 
As a result, staff forced her to carry six large rocks on her back at all times for several months, naming them issues like sexual abuse, sex addiction, causing bruising along her spine. At other times, inappropriate and humiliating interventions were used, such as forbidding youth from talking for several weeks, forcing youth to wear gloves because they, it was thought they were masturbating, or tying two girls together because they didn't get along. When I got caught with a plan to run away, I was placed on a personal intervention where I had to rock pick for a week, eight to 10 hours a day, and at one point dropped off 25 miles from school and forced to hike back. This was all done in the name of therapy. Education was nearly non-existent, claims of illness taken as manipulative. We had no access to advocates, no rights whatsoever. Then one day, 18 months later, I was told I was to be discharged. I had visited home maybe twice while there and was ever more grossly ill-prepared to function in the world. My nights were filled with a reoccurring nightmare of being chased by the founders and brought back to the facility, despite protests that I was healthy now. In the end, all Mission Mountain School gave me was more confusion, increased anxiety and depression, and made social functioning after discharge ever more difficult. The work I've done since then, I anticipate, will speak to the broad pattern of atrocities Dr. Pinto commented, commented on in her testimony at the hearings in October 2007. As co-founder co -founder and executive director of the Community Alliance for the Ethical Treatment of Youth, I have heard from over 1,000 survivors and understand that in most instances, parents, parents remain unaware of the abuse their children have experienced and often firmly believe the program saved their child's life. To me, this is the saddest repercussion of these facilities. At once, not only is the trust between parent and child broken, but the truth is f further hidden behind the facade promulgated by deceived parents. What I'm hoping to Wait, convey- I'm, ask you to, I'm gonna ask you to wrap up if you might. What I'm hoping to convey today through my testimony is that numerous residential facilities that are in operation are stripping youth of their basic human rights to dignity, respect, to least restrictive care, appropriate mental health treatment, to education and parental contact, to freedom of thought and opinion, and ultimately to freedom from censorship and torture. The legitimate practice of therapeutic intervention is being injected with a perverse form of social control, including inhumane treatment practices, which defy the ethical principles upheld by peer-reviewed mental health practices. I believe this bill to be a promising and important first step in curbing such draconian method methodology and applaud Chairman Miller for introducing the first piece of comprehensive legislation to that end.